Yes, indeed, the weather couldn't have cooperated better for today's uh, talk on bird migration. For those of us who love birds, and even for those who don't know much about them, the, the massive arrival and onslaught of birds this time of year uh, is something that's really hard to not notice. Um, I'm going to be talking about bird migration today and how we've been able to track the movements of individual songbirds for the first time. Um, and so we call this frequent flyers because these individual birds fly amazing distances and have amazing ability to navigate, um, which really is astounding. So these tracking devices allowed us for the first time to get a snapshot of what those individual birds might be experiencing during these incredible journeys. So as an example, the Wilson's warbler is a classic kind of Canadian songbird. Its breeding range spans the boreal forest of Canada. Its wintering range is in Central America. And these tiny little birds that weigh eight or nine grams fly annually from the breeding grounds to the wintering grounds and back again. An individual bird that lives three or four years, one of the older ones, would fly tens of thousands of kilometers in its lifetime. A tiny little warbler like this. Of course, these kind of movements put the birds at risk. These small birds, even in the best of circumstances, only about half of them survive the journey each year because it's dangerous. But of course, humans have transformed the landscape, especially in the last 100 years. So you can have a bird like the Wilson's warbler breeding, if it's lucky, in a patch of boreal forest, largely undisturbed by people. And if it's even luckier, it might find a location on the wintering grounds with large expanses of tropical forest, which are getting more and more scarce. But in order to get back and forth, they have to navigate through our urban landscapes, which blanket Eastern North America, getting through cities without getting killed flying into windows, getting through backyards without getting killed by people's cats. These birds have to fuel their migration by putting on huge amounts of fat. They burn fat when they exercise, not carbs like us. They burn fat, which we would like to have that, but we don't. <laughs> <laughs> but in order to do this, they have to refuel. And some of the critical stopover sites for these birds, they fly across the Gulf of Mexico. They have to refuel in the forests along the coast. But this is what it looks like now. Most of the forest is gone and replaced with agriculture. So the talk today has a, has a blend of the amazing abilities of these birds and how we can track them. But the reality is that many of these species are declining and this tracking is gonna help us understand what we can do to help these songbirds. So these are the little geolocators that we've been using for the last almost 10 years now. And they're very simple devices. Uh, there's a little light sensor on the end of a stalk and all the data is stored on board. So you put these on the bird's back, when during, usually during the breeding season, you catch them at the nest, you put the little backpack on, so it has a little harness like your kids going off to school, except on the birds, the backpack goes around their legs, so it sits on their lower back. And the little light stalk sticks up above the feathers so it can detect light. And your bird goes off wherever it goes, it goes off on migration at the end of the summer. And because they're very faithful to their breeding territories, if they survive the journey, they will come back to the same breeding territory the next year. Whereupon you catch them, take the backpack off, plug it into your computer and download all the data. Uh, and when you download the data and look at it, it looks kind of boring at first, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> These are light sensors and what this represents is nighttime. And then the sun comes up, and there's a daytime, and then the sun goes down, and it's nighttime. And the whole data file just looks like this for days and days on end. <clears throat> but the way these things work is so simple. Um, by knowing the time of sunrise and the time of sunset and the date, you can figure out the location. So this is one, um, this date here is the 4th of May, 2007, back when we were first trying these out. If you look up the sunrise and sunset times in Greenwich Mean Time, the universal time, you would be able to figure out where this geolocator was on the planet without me giving you any more information than what's in this slide. And you would discover that the geolocator was in Toronto. You wouldn't know exactly where in Toronto because it's not GPS. Right? But you would know it was Toronto. 
In fact, it was on the roof of the Lumbers building because we were testing these things out. So for most of the year, you can take sunrise and sunset and turn it into a latitude and longitude. And there's a few exceptions to this um, that I won't get into. They're not perfect, but, but, but for the first time ever, we had a device small enough to put on the back of a songbird to be able to get daily locations throughout the entire year. So here's, I'll show you a few examples of the kind of information we can get. And again, to, to really appreciate the significance of this, you have to realize that before 2007, there was no way to track small birds. We didn't have the technology. And what we knew about migration was just these glimpses of what happens when a bird is on the ground uh, refueling. But you really, you could not make maps like this at all until recently. So one of my study sites uh, is not too far from here. It's in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania, where I've worked for about 20 years. And one of our first studies was on wood thrushes, which are, you'll see in a minute, a declining forest songbird. Here's a male feeding the kids at his nest. And you can see the little backpack on him. Um, and so the, again, the bird would disappear and come back the next year. And uh, to see my graduate students who are working on this, the excitement. No one in the world had ever done this before. And they were out there, saw a bird who had come back with a geolocator on, and they caught him. And I will never forget them running into the field station, holding this little thing, we got one! <laughs> and then we had to download it, and you have all these data, and we analyzed it, and we were able to make a map like this for the first time. It was really astounding. So we knew from analyzing the data, I mean, that, that, you know, it, takes, it takes some time to work through the data, but you can make these maps, and we estimate that this male spent the winter in northern Honduras. Um, and this shows an example of spring migration. Comes up to the Yucatan Peninsula, crosses the Gulf of Mexico, and comes up the Mississippi River Valley. So the Mississippi River Valley uh, is a classic migratory highway for birds. It's a flyway. And so it's really not surprising that our birds are using this. We know from seeing the numbers of birds moving that this is a, a primary migration route. But the speed at which this bird flew really surprised us. It was still in Honduras on the 21st of April, and it was back at our study site by the 3rd of May. So that's only two weeks to fly that distance. You know, it's a wood thrush, not smaller than a robin even. Oh, I'll point this out. <clears throat> Remember, we, if the geolocator data I showed you, you would know that the bird was in Toronto area, but not exactly where. So this is full disclosure. These lines here represent um, the error in the geolocator. You know, they, they winter in forests. Sometimes it rains. And so the actual time of sunrise is not always recorded by the geolocator. The geolocator only knows when it gets bright. So in a dark, rainy morning, it's not going to give you accurate information. So really, in practice, this bird could have been anywhere here in eastern Honduras or western Nicaragua. We're not exactly sure. But we know it wasn't in Mexico. We know it wasn't in Costa Rica. So even then, we can zero in on the most likely areas. So that first year, um, my students were able to catch five wood thrushes with geolocators on. We'd only put on 14. So in the very first year we did this, they got back five geolocators out of the 14 we'd put on, which was way more than we were expecting. And the very fifth one was a female who they had discovered relatively late in the breeding season. And they felt kind of bad at first that they had missed the nest because they're out searching for nests and looking for things. And we realized, um, once we looked at the geolocator data, why that female wasn't found until later in the season. She did something very unusual. Came up to the Gulf of Mexico. You would expect she would fly across the Gulf like all the other birds. No. This one went around. She chickened out. <laughs> In that need. Uh, <laughs> this is a dangerous trip flying across the Gulf. Most birds do it because it's a shortcut. So here's our study site up here. Uh, most of the females are already on eggs by mid May. She was at the Texas Mexican border, <laughs> trying to get over the wall, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. And then finally, you know, loops around and makes her way back to northwestern Pennsylvania. 26th of May, she was really late. She wouldn't have even laid eggs until early June. And so again, we would have, without having these geolocators, we would have no clue what our birds had been doing. 
I wouldn't be able to understand basic facts about timing of arrival and what's causing that. So I think I've convinced you that the, these, little, these new technology for, for tracking birds is really amazing and there's all kinds of questions, important questions and fun questions that we can answer with these things. But it is kind of depressing to know that our study species is in steep decline. So this is the kind of depressing part of the talk that many of the birds that we're working with, uh, we want to discover their amazing behaviors and talents and skills, but at the same time, they're kind of in crisis, a conservation crisis. So these are um, annual counts of how many wood thrush are detected on standardized surveys across North America over time. And you can see for yourself back sort of near when I, when I was born, not too long ago, I hope. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, on average, eight wood thrushes per survey route, and now we're down to less than three. Massive decline in numbers. And so what's causing these kinds of declines? We have a lot of understanding about what's happening on the breeding grounds. Uh, if you look in Southern Ontario, where most of their breeding range, the forest patches that they have to breed in are small. It's all being chopped up. There's lots of agriculture, housing developments. And when birds breed in these small forest patches, they produce fewer offspring. So for sure, part of the cause of the decline is not enough production of offspring. But these birds cover great distances every year, and we can't blame the entire decline just on what's happening on the breeding grounds because they're migrating back and forth. And really, if you look at the wintering grounds, the breeding grounds are huge for wood thrush. It covers all of eastern US and a little bit in Canada. All of the wood thrushes in here pack into a tiny area on the wintering grounds. So we know that if you get massive tropical deforestation in one, any one of these countries, it's gonna have a big impact on the breeding population because the wintering grounds is so very small to begin with. And one thing that we can use these geolocators for is to answer the question, how does tropical deforestation impact breeding populations? It makes a difference where the birds are going. And there's two kind of opposite scenarios. The first is that breeding populations completely mix up on the wintering grounds. So you pick any patch of forest, like the Les Nubes forest in Costa Rica that York has. How many different breeding populations depend on that one forest patch? We don't know, until geolocators came along, there was really no way to know. So if you have a scenario like this, complete mixing, loss of any one area will have a relatively small impact over the entire species. But if you have a scenario like this, where different breeding populations have different wintering areas, then if you have deforestation, for instance, in Nicaragua, it will not affect the wood thrushes in the Midwest. They don't go there. It will have a big impact regionally, but not across the whole species. So we really, the, the basics, we need to know where these birds are going in order to understand this. So we have the geolocators, but in order to do this kind of mapping, we need to put geolocators on many different breeding and many different wintering populations to figure out who's going where. So um, we, on, for on the breeding grounds, for instance, we had ended up with five study sites in the sort of central and northeastern area. They're all color coded. And we tracked about 100 birds in total. Um, and if you look at where these birds went, you can see an interesting pattern, a really obvious pattern. Uh, if you look at the red stars in particular, that's our study site in Pennsylvania where we did most of the tracking. These are the pe Pennsylvania birds. And you can see down here that the Pennsylvania birds are cramming into this Eastern Honduras and Nicaraguan area, just like the examples I showed you earlier. They're not spreading out over the entire wintering area. This is the wintering area for wood thrushes as a species. These birds are going specifically to Eastern Central America with only a few exceptions. <coughs> but now, if we look at the birds in the Southwestern part of the breeding range, you'll see in a second, they go to a different part of the wintering grounds. So look at the black and yellow dots down here. Most of them are in the central and western side and only a couple ended up over here. So we kind of have a separation on the wintering grounds east-west. So you can take a map like this and turn it into what we call a migratory network. 
which in a snapshot, at one glance, you can kind of figure out who's going where, but you have to get used to it. So what this represents uh, up here are the different breeding regions, and these percentages all add up to 100 here. So we're saying what percentage of all wood thrushes across North America breed in the Northeast? It's 22%. What percentage are in the Central East? That's 36%. And then we want to ask how many of the Northeastern birds are going to which of the wintering areas? So the thickness of the line tells you how much traffic is happening between a breeding site and a wintering site. And you can see right away that the northeastern birds, almost all of them, are going to eastern wintering grounds. That's why 21% of, of all wood thrushes move between here and here. What is the point of all the numbers and the lines? Well, it's nice to have the network, but really the most important takeaway from it is the percentages at the bottom. We estimate that only 5% of all the wood thrushes alive today winter in Mexico. That's not an important wintering area for them. However, 54% of all wood thrushes winter in that narrow eastern corridor, eastern Nicaragua, eastern Honduras, and western Costa Rica. That's a small area geographically. That supports over half of the wood thrushes in North America. That means it's really important for conservation. So this is really how it, it divides out. Uh, the Midwestern birds are going here, the Southeastern birds are going here, and the Central and Northeastern breeders are going here. These colors tell a depressing story. It's the amount of forest that was lost in only a five-year period. This is from a, a paper that was published in Science. So the red, yellow, and orange along here are telling you that over 3% of those blocks were cut down in just a five-year period. Cumulatively, this is, amounts to a huge rate of deforestation. In fact, for the poor wood thrush, both of these core wintering areas are deforestation hotspots on a global scale. If you look around the world and say, where are the tropical forests being cut down the fastest? These are the two hotspots. Those are areas that wood thrush depend on. It's no wonder they are declined by over 50% since the 1960s. <clears throat> and if we look ahead, this is from the um, uh, Nicaraguan Forestry Department. If you look at the future, you can see, well, back in the 1980s, lots of forest cover. Not so good today, and in 35 years, there's only going to be a few forest patches left. You know, you may say, this is terrible. You know, we've already done this to eastern North America. You know, they're just kind of behind the curve time-wise. They're doing the same thing to their forests that we've already done to ours. So what is the hope for the wood thrush? Uh, well, there, are, there will be um, preserves that are always protected that will help support the species and prevent it from going extinct. But there's more that we can do as well. Wood thrushes, like many migratory songbirds, will occupy shade coffee plantations. So this is sort of a win-win. The farmers can produce high-quality shade-grown Arabica coffee. The birds have habitat to live in, orchids, bees, small mammals, yeah, all the tropical species can survive in this kind of shade coffee habitat. High quality, sustainable agriculture. Unfortunately, in many regions, the vast majority of coffee is grown either like this, with a cup, just a couple of shade trees, or like this, like a cornfield. These bottom two examples do not provide habitat for forest birds. So one way that we can help wood thrushes is to buy real shade-grown coffee. It's hard to find. You can't drive up at the Timmy's window and ask for shade-grown coffee in a double-double. <laughs> they don't, they would just, they would look at you in shock. They wouldn't know what you're talking about. But there are many groups that do produce authentic certified shade-grown coffee, and you can buy it online. That's what I do. I don't drive around trying to find it at the grocery store. I buy it online and it's just shipped to my front door. Every morning I get out the coffee grinder. And, and, I, and I sit there drinking my coffee knowing that it came from habitat like this and that I'm helping. It really is important. And unfortunately, uh, it's really hard to convince the major coffee growers to promote shade-grown coffee because it's not in their economic interests. Oops, sorry. So remember, the birds have to get back and forth. 
Um, and so the, the geolocator is not only can we map out the destination, but we can also look at the routes. And wood thrushes do a loop migration. This is not uncommon. A lot of species do this. If you look at the fall route, they come down here through Florida, Western Cuba, and the Yucatan. In the spring, as we've seen before, they come up to the Yucatan. Most of them cross the Gulf of Mexico and make landfall near the New Orleans area. This is where the Mississippi River Delta is. Uh, and then swing up back to their breeding sites. As we saw an example earlier, a few chicken out and go around, around the corner. <laughs> So in terms of conservation, this kind of loop migration makes it even more difficult to figure out what can we do to save these birds? Because if you protect the breeding habitat and the wintering habitat, and only that, which even that is impressive, um, there can still be weak links in the chain if there's not good stopover habitat along the way. So for wood thrushes, we realize that we also have to do something about protecting habitat in Southern Florida and Western Cuba for fall migration. Uh, and in the Yucatan and the Mississippi River Delta for spring migration. And I know these network things are, can be annoying to look at, but this is the one we looked at before, the wintering grounds. And um, all I want to do is show you how, how different the networks are. If you look at the fall migration route, the wintering grounds and the spring route, we can kind of leave the numbers aside and say, okay, which site holds the most birds? This is southern Florida, this is the eastern gulf, the central gulf, and the western gulf of the U.S. coast. Where do we get the most wood thrushes flying through? 52% go through southern Florida. If you had to pick, where am I going to focus my efforts to save some habitat? At least for wood thrushes, it would be southern Florida, right here, eastern Nicaragua, right here, and in the spring, 71% of all wood thrushes fly through the central gulf, the Mississippi River Delta. That's where we should focus our conservation efforts. So these, this kind of migration tracking can tell us really important things about conservation and at least where to start for individual species. I've told you about wood thrushes so far. Um, they're sort of a poster bird for declining forest birds. They're sort of a classic bird in decline requiring tropical rainforests, requiring large forests on the breeding grounds, and they have their own unique set of challenges and threats. The other bird that I've worked on is the purple martin, which is very, very different from wood thrushes. It's an aerial insectivore. And what this means is that they make their, their swallows, they make their living, feeding, flying around in the air, catching insects on the wing. So they catch flying insects. So they have a very unique food supply and of course, they're extremely good at flying because they have to be able to catch other organisms that are flying. And you can see here a, a purple martin with a big dragonfly in its mouth. Uh, purple martins are pretty big swallows and they eat butterflies, dragonflies, moths, um, and smaller stuff as well. <clears throat> um, they have a long distance migration. So purple martins winter in South America. So they go through Central America and just keep right on going down into Brazil. And the aerial insectivores as a group um, have this sort of common problem that the northern populations are declining. The southern ones seem to be doing okay, but the northern populations are declining. This is true for other species of aerial insectivores as well, things like barn swallows, chimney swifts. There's this common pattern. Why are the northern populations declining so badly? So I thought, well, we can put the geolocators on. First step is to find out where they're going on the wintering grounds and whether the northern populations are facing different kinds of threats. <clears throat> so just like with the wood thrushes, we were able to discover some, some amazing things about their, their migration pace, et cetera. This is an example of a root of an individual bird. Um, and you can see here, when, one thing that really surprised us is they, when they begin migrating, they take only a couple days to get to the US Gulf Coast and fly across the Gulf. So this bird, for instance, are at our breeding site, 29th of August, two days later, it's on the, US, the Florida Panhandle. I mean, they are flying 400 kilometers a day when they feel like it. And on both trips, the fastest part of the trip is through the US. And when they get into Central America, they kind of go slowly and then they speed up again once they get into South America. But when they turn on those burners, they can go amazingly quickly. We didn't know that they could migrate this fast. <clears throat> 
So the short answer to our question about whether northern populations are facing different threats is no, they're not. Very unlike the wood thrush that kind of splits on the wintering grounds, the purple martins, every breeding population in the eastern subspecies completely mixes. So we've tracked birds from all these populations of the eastern subspecies, anywhere from Texas, Florida, Alberta, they all go to the same wintering area. In fact, individual wintering sites could have birds side by side from any place in East, at any place. Alberta and Florida birds could end up side by side. That was a real surprise. The other surprise was that we were expecting these birds to migrate to southern Brazil. That's the open agricultural landscape. That's where people see them the most often. But in fact, all of these birds are tracked to the heart of the Amazon River, the heart of the Amazon rainforest. When you look at forest cover, the average wintering site has over 90% forest cover around it. So these birds that nest in people's backyards and birdhouses, you know, with dogs and cats and screaming babies, then they go south through our busy cities across highways, when they finally get to their wintering site, they probably spend six months flying around without hardly seeing a person because they're in one of the last great wilderness areas on the planet. It's really astounding. So it's not true that northern populations are declining because of uh, habitat loss, because the habitat is intact, right? And all the birds are going to the same place. One thing that, that I'll just point out, but I don't really want to talk about it much, is there's a Western subspecies of purple martin uh, that one of our collaborators was able to track about five or six birds from Vancouver Island. And we had, again, we had no idea where these birds would winter, and it's kind of interesting. They have their own unique wintering site here <laughs> in southern Brazil. So at a subspecies level, they're going to different places, meaning that genetically speaking, they have instructions to tell them to go to different places. They don't learn where they're going. Young songbirds are born knowing where they're supposed to go. It's all genetically encoded. And so these two subspecies do not interbreed, and they have different destinations for whatever reason. So what I'm going to show you now, I just have a few more slides here, um, is the, we've done enough tracking in purple martins. We've tracked over 200 purple martins from across their breeding range. No one else has done this sort of migration tracking on this kind of geographic scale or, or get the numbers. Um, somebody's gonna ask me after the talk, how many geolocators do you get back? Like in wood thrushes, we put on 14, we got five back. We've tracked 200 purple martins. How many geolocators did we have to actually put on to get that many? It's like 800. Oh, how much do they cost, Bridget? <laughs> Next question, right? There's $200 each. This is tough, right? And, you, and you, you, you put them on, but you don't get them all back, right? If the bird doesn't come back, you get no data. But what you do get is amazing. So what I'm going to do is show you a video starting on the breeding grounds, and you'll see the flow of birds. These are the birds we actually tracked, sort of like uh, sand going through an hourglass. The birds will trickle down into Brazil. They'll be in Brazil for the winter, and then they'll start trickling back up again. And what you'll notice, and it's kind of hard, I'm telling this ahead of time so you can pick it out, the birds in uh, Texas and Florida start first, right? It's warmer down there. They breed earlier and they start migrating earlier. They're on a different annual schedule. So anyway, let's just watch this go. I knew that was coming. So if you look here, these, are, these clusters show um, our different study sites. Alberta, right, the Dakotas, Florida, we have a few up. And so if you watch, you'll see these birds down here will start moving, but the ones way up north haven't finished breeding yet. So anyway, I'll we'll stop talking. We'll just have fun watching it. <laughs> see, the first ones are in Brazil. Comes a next wave in Brazil. So here we've got a bunch of birds packed into Brazil. This is their core favorite wintering area, in northwestern Brazil, which is kind of around the area of Manaus. And notice too that the, the, the Florida, western Cuba, Yucatan is really important flyway for them in the fall. Here they come through Central America. And then finally, I know there's no calendar on here, but right now it would be November. They're all there in Brazil. 
And they do move around a little bit. They're not married to one particular spot. About half the birds will you know, fly across Brazil and try a different place. And right here, you can see the Florida birds are coming back. The Texas birds are coming back. There come a bunch more. And again, these waves are because we have different study sites at different latitudes. Again, in terms of stopover, the Yucatan and the Mississippi River Delta are really important as well. So for purple martins, um, we haven't really talked much about what they do when they're down in Brazil. They have this really amazing behavior during uh, fall migration and on the wintering grounds, they gather in massive roosts. When birds sleep at night, we call it roosting. Um, and these roost sites are, at least in North America, the birders all know where they are because you have 100,000 purple martins sleeping at night in the same place, often uh, in trees in a, in a Walmart shopping plaza or on an island, you know, clearly visible from um, roads or even on bridges. So here's an example in North Carolina where there's been a roost for years halfway along this causeway and every single night, hundreds of thousands of martins gather for safety right, safety in numbers, and they're trying to find a safe place to sleep at night, which usually means an island or a bridge. So we know this about North American birds. Um, we also can find roosts with weather radar. There are so many birds in these roosts that in the morning when they wake up and leave to go and feed, it makes a donut on the radar. <laughs> so here's, even if you didn't know where they were, you would know from looking at radar, you can do this you know, from your desk computer at home, that there must be a roost somewhere in here uh, because this radar signature is so unique. So people have mapped out the major roost sites from looking at weather radar. So with purple martins, yeah, they're wintering in the Amazon rainforest. You might think, oh, this is a huge amount of habitat. There's no conservation needs whatsoever because the Amazon rainforest is a limitless resource. Well, how do we know that? What the geolocators cannot tell us exactly where the birds are. But fortunately, we have new technology now that does do this. These are archival GPS tags. So same thing, you put them on the bird as a backpack. You pre-program them to get 10 or 15 exact GPS locations during the bird's journey. So you tell it what date and time you want it. It turns on, it gets the GPS location, and then it remembers it. You still have to get the, the thing off the bird's back when it comes back in the spring, but at least now you can pinpoint exactly where that bird was. So here's some examples. Um, a geolocator, if it had been a geolocator on the bird's back, you would say, okay, it stopped here somewhere on the coast of Belize, but you don't know exactly where. But with the archival tag, you can say, oh, it was this little island off the coast of Belize City. Here's Belize City. Here's the actual roost site over here. Here's another one in eastern Nicaragua. Geolocator somewhere on the coast of Nicaragua. Archival device, tiny little island in a river. One more, for the, and this is what I'm really interested in is identifying wintering sites. Uh, geolocator, it's somewhere near the Rio Negro, Manaus area in here. Little island in the middle of the lake. So it's actually possible that there are specific roost sites that are really, really important to purple martins that should be targeted for conservation. Uh, and that's the next step in this project, is identifying how many different roost sites they are and being able to map them out exactly and provide good sound advice on to what extent this habitat is really critical and needs to be protected. <clears throat> so just a couple more slides and then, and then we're done. So with purple martins, we don't think it's habitat loss, which is the problem, because the wintering habitat is largely intact and there are probably lots of little islands along the Amazon River. We don't really know, we're trying to figure that out. The other explanation for northern populations being in trouble is yes, climate change, because the climate is changing the most as you go farther north. So it makes sense, northern populations are in trouble, maybe they can't cope with climate change. So we had um, a little bit of good luck. In 2012, it was the warmest spring on record in the US and Canada. Probably remember it, it was March and people were out in their shorts. It was even better than today, even warmer than today. And it went on for a couple of weeks. So we looked at 
the migration tracking we'd done in normal years versus 2012 to ask the question, how well can Purple Martins cope with an unusually warm spring? Do they come back earlier? Do they leave Brazil earlier? Do they arrive at their breeding colonies earlier? If everything's happening earlier, the birds should come back earlier. The trouble is, though, that they can't detect those temperature cues from 5,000 kilometers away in Brazil, which sort of seems obvious. <laughs> but the geolocators give us a chance to actually go retroactively look at what the weather was at the places that they were in Brazil. So here's just a, we're not going to go through this whole thing. But for instance, in Pennsylvania, at our study site, the average daily temperature in April was 10 degrees Celsius in a normal year and almost 15 in the warm year. So huge difference in temperature between, I mean, it's the warmest year on record, of course, it's going to be a big difference. Now we're going to go down to northern Brazil, the Manaus area. No difference in temperature, no difference in rainfall. Even in Panama, they all fly through Panama, the land bridge. No difference in temperature. It wasn't the warmest year on record in Panama. It wasn't the warmest year on record in the Yucatan. So really, it's not until the birds hit the US Gulf Coast that there's some signal that it's an unusual year. And remember, I told you, they fly really quickly through the US portion of their trip, going 400 kilometers a day. So by the time they reach the US Gulf Coast and get a signal that it's warmer, it's really too late to speed up and save any time. They've already covered 80% of their trip, and they can't get back faster. So again, if you look at, at this graph here, this is a normal year. Just look at this one for now. This is the arrival date at the breeding colony. They usually arrive on this date. In the warmest year on record, did they arrive earlier? No, if anything, they just a hair later. So this, th these kind of data can tell us um, with great confidence just exactly how long distance migrants can detect, if they can detect climate change, and if they can speed up. And the answer is no. So for at least for something like purple martins, we, th we think that part of the problem about northern populations being declining the most is probably linked to their inability to adjust to climate change. So I've talked only about two species today, the ones that I've worked on intensively. Um, but this new technology of, of being able to track small birds really exploded after we published our first paper on, on wood thrushes and purple martins. Uh, researchers around the world in the last five years have put geolocators on literally dozens of species of small birds. And this just gives you a, a snapshot of some of the, a lot of the work is in North America, but we have migration systems in Europe. Um, people are studying all kinds of different species, revealing the migration routes and timing and conservation threats that all these different species th face, because now we can actually map out those routes and those wintering grounds. And then finally, um, some, some of these studies have found the most remarkable migration feats of these little birds. Um, my favorite one is the black pole warbler who breaks all of our conventional rules about bird migration for small birds. In fall, and this, this is the track of an individual bird, uh, they leave the eastern coast of Canada and fly nonstop, like nonstop for 3,000 kilometers over the ocean. 48 hours of nonstop flight. In order to fuel up for this kind of flight, black pole warblers, normally they weigh about 12, 14 grams, which is really the weight of a couple of tunies, if anyone has a, you know, that endless change in your pocket problem. <laughs> Two tunies, right? Bird this big. They will put on huge amounts of fat, almost double their weight. And then they take off and they burn all that fat. By the time they arrive down here, they burned it all off. So they can burn off 40% of their body mass in two days. Right? That's amazing. <laughs> so my, my final point before I take questions is that um, a lot of reporters ask me, why should we care that birds are declining? I hate that question. <laughs> and of course, you have, you have a choice how you answer it. Uh, you could say, we should care because birds are an important part of our, their, our ecosystem. True. Uh, they disperse fruits and help trees and plants reproduce. They eat insects. They're important for insect control and therefore forest growth. 
they uh, provide ecosystem services to humanity and they're economically important, therefore. That's answer A. Answer B is black pole warbler. These things are amazing. Of course we should care. We should protect these species because they've evolved such amazing, extraordinary behaviors. Thanks, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank <laughs> you.